time with our elderly senior citizens so uh, thank you so much thank you so much evangelist it too please make your way um, we thank God for the good time there's there's people who were ravaged by COVID by the way um, you know and why are you still alive <laughs> why I think God is just saying he's nudging us hey you are here to worship me. Stop, stop all this busyness and just worship me. I think that's what God has kept us for. Okay? You were out. You were almost out. You nearly went under, you know. But he kept you. It was in ICU. Some of you, you know it. But God kept us. He hid us. Our symbols. So he gave us yet another chance to worship him. That's what he said. Bless you, men of God. Come pray for the saints. Let's have 
a moment of gratitude. Just to revise, review, and reflect on how gratitude impacts our lives. Statistics show that the attitude of gratitude can pave a way for deeper relationships, can pave a way for a better health, can pave a way for increased productivity in life. If there is less productivity, maybe it's time to go back and say, how grateful am I? And some of the sicknesses can just be resolved by gratitude. And some of our relationships can just be dealt with by appreciating one another and those that are around you. In fact, it says here there is a study that showed that uh, dedicating five minutes of your time every single day to gratitude can change your life forever. In fact, it can increase your long-term well-being by more than 10%. Brothers and sisters, there is too much negativity around us. But we need to be more grateful than we normally are and have ever been. We need to be more intentional about our gratitude and not treat it as a by-the-way matter. Because it's a serious matter. Gratitude must be at the center of our worship. And I've come to believe that without the gratitude, a worship and a devotion that is empty of gratitude is a dry worship. And it doesn't yield much result. Gratitude is powerful and the devil knows it. And that's why every time he throws things that we can complain about so as to withhold us and derail us from focusing on our God. He has made us numb towards acknowledging the good that the Lord is doing for us. But allow me and say, here's the reason why we need to be grateful. We need to be grateful because God knows the plans that he has for us. In Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11, God says, for I know the plans that I have for you. And he says, number one, these are plans to prosper you. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, plans to prosper you. And these are plans not only to prosper you, but to also give you a future. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, the future is ahead of you. These are plans not only to prosper you and give you a future, but also the expected end. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, be expectant. And as I pray right now, here's the thing. I want us to stand on this one. Forget everything else, but stand on this one. When God spoke Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11, it was not to people that were in Jerusalem, but people that were in Babylon. You missed it. So God does not speak to the children of... So he speaks to his own children. But the location is different. They are in captivity. But God's, God wants them to adopt the attitude of gratitude while in captivity. So, so, so have you ever been in a foreign land and God expects something that you never thought he could ever expect? 
It's like when you are sick and he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. So God wants us to make a move even when we are in trouble. So he speaks to them. They are in a foreign land, but he wants them to be in liberty while they are in captivity. You missed it. And he mentions four things. I'm just concluding now. He says to them while they are in captivity, build houses. Have you ever been in captivity and somebody says, build your house? So in other words, make yourself at home in a foreign land. And secondly, he says, when you have built houses, make sure that you plant your own gardens. Because God understands that the hand that feeds you controls your mind. And God says, while you are in captivity, be in liberty to provide for yourself or plant your own gardens and thirdly God says to them have families get married give your children also to get married because I'm just about to do something wonderful and he says fourthly have social responsibility pray for your captors so in other words, pray for those that brought you to captivity. And he says, because the good that comes to them because of your prayers benefits you. And he says, after 70 years, then I will come and visit you. So he does not say, I'm visiting you now. So in other words, you will stay longer, but it does not mean I'm not coming. For I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you. Even in the land of captivity. Plans to give you a future. And also plans to give you an expected end. I want us to pray right now. As we hold on to God. And trust in him with our issues with our sicknesses with our finances with our mountains with our storms with our winds with the rains that are falling with the negativity that is around us let's show some gratitude to god let's pray together father in heaven thank you for who you are to us and thank you for your plans that they are better, greater, and bigger than the problems that we are going through. Thank you, Heavenly Father, this morning that we have come into your presence, most holy presence, to experience your holiness. Father, we have not come to receive, we have come to give to you. And the receiving father becomes the consequences of our commitment and devotion to you and i pray father that you deal with our mindsets and our attitudes straighten them up so that they are aligned with your will for our lives we want to know your purpose this morning father our coming here must not be a futile exercise we have spent time father demanding and asking but Lord we want to spend this time in gratitude we pray father that may you receive a praise and a blessing from us there's so much that you have done for us there's so many blessings you have poured upon us there's so many breakthroughs you have given us there are so many opportunities you have opened for us there are so many doors father you have given us so many connections so many people you have put in our lives and father we have seen mountains going flat before us we have seen father sicknesses being healed just before our eyes father we have seen relationships being mended we have seen heavenly father our children coming back to the lord after they left 
we have seen heavenly father the salvation of the lord in our own homes we have seen heavenly father you adding more blessings to us as we grow from one year or the other father we pray father that you will receive a blessing this morning father you have kept us from one conference to the other we bless your most holy name father we have gone through father we witness so many deaths in our families and communities we have witnessed accidents lord you have kept us and we are still here father we are still here there could be some that are still missing lord but you have kept us we are still here and if we are here father you are here then we have a reason to praise you father we thank you for this program that you have put together just for us to reflect on the goodness of the lord and how you have walked with us through the ways and the waves of this life and how lord you have carried us from one generation to the other from one point to the other father we thank you we thank you because you are faithful even when we are faithless and your faithfulness lord does not hang and hinge on how unfaithful we are because you are god jehovah constant all the time thank you father for your goodness and thank you father for what you are just about to experience in this place we want to shower blessings upon this session father we declare a special blessing upon Dana, father and the team father and the friends and his family and the ministry we commit them into your hands and we stand and declare that the enemy has no plan has no power has no influence into what is about to happen in this place father we pray for salvation of someone that through this program and ministry someone will find their savior will meet their messiah will make a decision for him will choose him as their lord and personal savior thank you father something great is just about to happen in this place and we lift our hands in awe we lift our hands in gratitude we lift our hands in praise we lift our hands heavenly father to glorify you because all honor glory majesty belong to you for we ask all this in jesus name lord rebuke the enemy he has no power in this place father we pray and ask that the blood of jesus may be poured down in this place cover us with your righteousness remove the stains of every sin from every person that is here father we are your people you are our god thank you for your good plans to prosper us prosper this place in jesus name we pray amen
Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Uh, we are diatonic. Um, we are here to bless you guys today, and we hope that you guys will be blessed. Um, I'm just going to quickly introduce the members up front here. We've got Ash on soprano. We've got um, Bali on alto. We've got Lelo as our bass. We are a year old. We are going to be releasing our single um, for the first time ever um, this coming month. So if you do like our music, please um, do follow us on our socials and we will be very happy to have you guys follow us. Thank you very much. Hope you guys will be blessed.
actually we're going to do our second song. Um, it's a very familiar song. Um, if you guys feel like dancing with us, you can come along and dance with us. Thank you. Yeah. 
a fire that needs to warm you up when you start opening your your mouth and join in sing not because of the person next to you but sing because of the one who's around you who's got you surrounded who's got you covered and so we'd like to really invite you into praising God in spite of praise God in spite of but before I can tell you further, I'm going to introduce uh, my wife to you. I only have one wife. Amen. Because Amen. a lot of people have been confused by Abefundis, Mabeti, four better, four worse. They were thinking in numbers. Four better, four worse, four sickness. So they thought they needed 12 wives. No, only one Bazalwan. That is a F O R. <laughs> So I'd like to introduce Mars. It's your turn. We bless God this morning. Amen. We're here because God said so. It's not about your alarm system. It's not about what you drove. It's not about the homes you live in. It's because God said, give them one more opportunity. You know, we come to churches, I, I, think I'm, I think I'm conferenced out, retreat out, <laughs> because we come and we gather, but we don't leave different than when we came. I'm just hoping this morning that this is a different time. This is a different service. There's a service later tonight. I'm not calling it a concert. There's a service later tonight. And this stage needs to be set. Why? Because someone needs to accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior. As Adventist Christians, we assume, we assume that because we dress well, we drive well, we look well, that we have met our Lord. I want to dispel that because we need to come just as we are, but not remain that way. That's what this is for. This is plowing the ground this morning so that fertile seed can be laid this evening and that someone's life will be changed. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, I want my life to change. <laughs> Please look at your neighbor. I want my life to change. You know, we come, we're on the phones, but we don't know what Jesus wants to say to us. These are serious times, and my husband's going to read a scripture right now that deals with serious times. This morning on the way here, 
We flew in from the Western Cape last night. But this morning, we saw two little... I've lived in Haltang as well, in Johannesburg. But I saw something today I've never seen before. There was a little six-year-old, maybe six, and her little sister, maybe five. And they were doing the begging this morning. I've I've not seen that, y'all. They were doing the begging. And I'm trying to look to see the woman, she was a girl herself, maybe 18, sitting with a baby. Why this five and six year old were knocking on windows, begging. These are serious times we're living in. It can't be business as usual. So when we come and gather like this, God is giving us, Mother Eve said it this way, after Cain left, after killing Abel, Mother Eve is depressed, discouraged. She's without her two sons. Genesis chapter 4 says Adam knew Eve again, and she was with child. She doesn't give Adam the credit in verses 4. It's Genesis 4, verse 25. She says, God hath given me a new seed. Say new seed. Say it louder, new seed. That means a new opportunity. We have a new opportunity this morning to be changed, to be renewed, to be rededicated, to make a decision that God can use me. Baba, please read. Okay, let's read. It's 2 Chronicles 20, and we'll go to um, verse 12. And our God... Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless against this great multitude with this, which is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. So all of Judah stood before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children. We don't know what to do. Can we say that? Do you know what to do about this gender-based violence situation? Do you know what to do? We are number one in the world for gender-based violence. Did you know that? We are number one in the world for violent rape. We are number one in the world for unemployment for our young people. I'm just talking about us here. I'm not talking about the rest of the world. We are number one in areas where we should not be. And so there's a great army coming against us, and we just have to admit We don't know what to do. I'm a clinical counselor, or I'm a therapist in the clinical arena. And a lot of the younger generation women, professional women, whose CVs would blow you away, but emotionally are wounded and broken and are not knowing what to do about what's going on at home. The majority of them are single parents trying to make it, trying to be mother and father at the same time. We don't know what to do. Can we confess that? Because once we can admit to God we don't know, then God can come with the solution. But when we act like we know, because we're quoting the same text, but we don't know what they mean, Jehoshaphat humbled himself before God and said, we don't know what to do, Lord. Come by here. Come by here. Come by here, O Lord. Come by here. And then as we read the rest of 2 Chronicles 20, we find out that God instructs Jehoshaphat, call for a fast, then go out to fight these armies, but bring forth the musicians. How about that? Didn't the musicians blow horns and the walls of Jericho fall down? There's something about being a minister of music. I, I don't take issue with worship leaders, but I'm uncomfortable with that. God is the only one that needs to be worshiped. But as ministers of music, 
we invoke the praise and the glory that is due to God. We invoke the praises and the worship that is due to God. May God give us a heart this morning. I'm going to ask you just to stand because we're going to pray. We want to invoke the Spirit of God in this place before tonight. How about that? Because someone's coming that doesn't know the Lord, who's never met the Lord, who needs to meet the Lord. It's cold, but I tell you what, if you stand close to each other, you'll feel the warmth. Each of us in here are ministers of music. Not because you sing well, but because you praise well. God needs our praise. Look at your neighbor and say your praise. He needs your praise this morning. Okay, let's pray. Let's pray. Father, our God, we belong to you. We are yours. And we are not here to repeat the same thing. But we are here, Lord, because we need to hear from you. These days we're living in, it's beyond important to not only hear from you, but to act on what we hear. Because, Lord, we know that in your presence there's fullness of glory. In your presence there's pleasures forevermore. In your presence there's change of hearts. In your presence there is the Holy Spirit that works to change lives. In your presence, poverty is broken. In your presence, Lord, all chains that have been holding people back are broken. In your presence, religion dies because relationship takes over. In your presence, Lord, there is revelation. In your presence, Lord, there's breakthroughs. In your presence, there is, there is provision. In your presence, Lord, there is bringing back those who are lost. In your presence, Lord, it is reaching out to our children who we do not know where they are. Have them walk through the door, not because they're coming just to see us, but they're coming because they're coming to see you. And we benefit from that. In your presence, there is everything. Father, we're here to say, may your presence cover each and every one of us in this room right now. <laughs> Father, there may be someone who's here contemplating, thinking about what am I going to do when I have to go home because they are facing demons that wait in the house. Father, I say those demons, may they be broken as we pray in the name of Jesus. May that abuser who's waiting yeah. to ask questions yeah. of someone who's come to give glory to God today, may he say, I want to come join you tomorrow yeah. because I do not know why there's a change of heart because your presence, Lord. In your presence, Father, there's safety. We do not need to worry about where we are and what is going on in your presence. There's fullness of glory, Father. There's going to be new songs that are going to be born. There's going to be the fulfillment of give unto the Lord a new song, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, a change of hearts, yes, and a redirection of ways that we've always known, a starting of new ways so that others may follow for a change. As opposed to us following, Father, we want to be those whom we call the head and not the tail. Yes, in your presence, Father, the armies were defeated. In your presence, Father, whenever the armies rose up, they got confused. And Father, in your presence, there is more and more and more. So we want to thank you today for your spirit that is present here in Jesus' name. In Take Jesus. over, Lord, because that's what we need. We yes, need your Lord. spirit. We do not want to do our own what we know. We want you to do what is best for us. Yes, so, Father, speak today. Change hearts. Change everything. The program belongs to you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Sabbath Church. One, two. Happy Sabbath Church. Amen. Amen. It is indeed a beautiful Sabbath. Amen. We are Harmonium Quartet. Harmonium Quartet, a group of young, uh, young individuals. Maybe not so young, but yeah, we're just here to share the good news of Christ. Amen. One, two. Testing. One, two. One, two, one, two. Oh, worship the King, O oh, glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilion in splendor, ran girded with grace. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air. Shines in the light, he streams from the hills, he descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail. In thee do we trust, Lord, find thee to fail. Thy mercies are tender, how firm to the end. Our Maker, Defender, Redeemer. Living in the sunlight of His love, resting on His mighty arm, knowing that He watches over me, shielding me from men.
God's people this morning. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, amen. Amen, Bazalwa. Part of this program this morning is a reflection on where we come from as a people. It is very important to know, particularly, particularly the black church needs to understand where we come from as black members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Just a couple of days ago, I sat in a service, an induction service of our young people, pathfinders, who were receiving honors, and those that had fulfilled the requirements of the Master Guide program in order for them to advance and graduate, receive honors. And I made an observation in the service that part of the heritage, the history of the church, the Adventist church, that you have gone through in order for you to be awarded is the North American based history of the church which is very important but incomplete because then you have to learn about Uriah Smith James White J.N. Andrews L.N.G. White and a host of other pioneers uh, but who are mainly North American based you do need to understand that Adventism is Catholic is universal much as it owes and credits its origin its genesis in that part of the world in Battle Creek in Michigan you need to understand that true to the prophetic pronouncement that was made in the book of Acts chapter 1 that it will start here but then it will spread. You then need to make an acknowledgement of the various places on the African continent where Adventism settled and ensconced itself. This continent has incubated Adventism since 1887. And as we speak now, Adventism grows faster on the African continent than anywhere else. And so I just want to share with you this morning, um, you may want to go to the first slide. There is a a prophetic pronouncement made in the book of Psalm 68 verse 31 princes shall, shall come out of Egypt Ethiopia will stretch out her hand to God in adoration Envoys and ambassadors shall come out of Egypt. Something will happen 
on the continent of Africa when God speaks from the throne room Africa will respond and this will happen guess what from the southern tip of the continent in 1887 when C.L. Boyd landed on the shores of Cape Town starting a missionary expedition that gained momentum in 1887, 1888, 1889. The ardent students of Adventist history will remember that in 1888, in Minnesota, Minnesota Conference, the General Conference sat there and grappled with a number of theological questions, including justification by faith 1888 but something happened beyond that discussion they read a telegram in that general conference written by a small band of Dutch speaking men from Kimberley the vessel's family wrote and sent this telegram which arrived in that general conference session in 1888 and was read to the delegates. It was not part of the script. It was not on the agenda. But someone walked to the brethren up in front and said, I have something from Africa. And I need for you to pause and to read what is contained therein. And the telegram said, send us workers. Send workers to Africa. Now there is a part that has not been published in that telegram. The part that was not published said, send only those that speak the Dutch language. Inside the telegram, there was 150 pounds. The first offering, if you please, from Africa to the general conference came from the vessel's family. The vessel's family who were wealthy, for in the farm that they had in Kimberley, diamonds had been found. And so the Jar Conference sent a band of the early missionaries that came over here. Only one of them was Dutch speaking, the rest was English. And when they landed in Cape Town, a man had been sent, the A.T. Robinson had been sent, but he was soon captured by this family and he forgot the mandate the mandate was very simple and the mandate came from Australia from Sister White who was in Australia for nine years at the time she wrote a letter and sent it to Cape Town and said to A.T. Robinson who was the president of the then called South African Conference don't spend your money building institutions. Spend money in publishing and printing tracts in African languages. A.T. Robinson, who was captured by this Dutch-speaking family, the vessels, who were bankrolling the program of the church, forgot that mandate and they went ahead and built institutions they built what they call the sun the sanitarium after the model that they had seen in North America and they built in Claremont Cape Town the Union College 
because the two brothers, Philip and Peter Vessels, the son of Johann Vessels, the rich man of Kimberley, had gone to study at Battle Creek. And when they got there, they said, we want to build something like this when we go back to Africa. And Ellen Ward says, don't spend money building something like this. Instead, develop the work, build work among African people. Well, the little band of missionaries moved from Cape Town and settled in Kimberley, where the money was. That was a mistake. When they got there, they were captured by this family. Well, there was something wrong with this family. The family had money. And so they built the college, they built the sun. The sun was a boutique hospital. The furniture in this institution was imported from Europe. It was a beautiful three-story building built against the wishes of Sister White. Something happened. The older brother Phillips, Philip Vessels, in 1893, I hope you'll be able to see, I'll just go through what he said. He said a lot of things, but this is a critical extraction I want to share with you. I hear what Sister White says. I hear about the admonishings and the warnings and the counsel. Then he says, and I quote, this is 1893. I do not want my children to associate with the lower classes of colored people. I will labor for them. I will teach my children to do so. But I do not want my children to mix with them. For such is detrimental to their moral welfare. Nor do I want my children to think that there is no difference in society that they should finally associate and even marry the colored blood. Now these are the pioneers of the Adventist church in this country. This is the mindset, the attitude, as the evangelist spoke about attitude earlier. This is the attitude they had. So the foundation of Adventism in South Africa or on the African continent was cracked from the very, very beginning. The attitude, the message was right, but the attitude was wrong. Those that hosted the message needed to be transformed, needed to be cleansed. And so when we talk about Adventist heritage, Adventist history on the African continent, we need to be careful what we are talking about. The reason the church is not growing as it should in South Africa is because the foundation was not strong from the very beginning. Adventism is what I call mission in transit. It came to South Africa not to settle, but to proceed and move to other areas and growth is seen elsewhere and not here. Something and I'm going to perhaps just go to something else here. The president A.T. Robinson struggled with this family. This was the family that built the sanitarium. This is the family that put money into building the Union College, which is a, a forerunner of Held Up a College, 1893. This is the family that stood and said, it's our money that did all of this. Ellen White says, the sanitarium will bend down. Your attitude is not right. It will bend down to the ground. 
Did you know that she also wrote that what we refer to today as the second South African war or the Anglo Boer War as it used to be called she said had you listened to my counsel the second Anglo Boer War would not have happened 1905 the sanitarium burned to the ground it was never rebuilt until today the college closed down and they moved to Ladysmith in KwaZulu Natal place called Spionkop 30 kilometers west of Ladysmith they settled over there and all the uh, but they still did not learn that was a school for whites they would not al- allow black students in there but something happened because the prophecy stood it wouldn't change. Ethiopia will stretch out her hands to God in adoration. Africa will rise. During the second camp meeting which was held in Kimberley in 1895, in the audience was a man this was a Dutch medium camp meeting. But there was a man sitting at the back there listening because he could understand, he could speak Dutch. English and Dutch were the only official languages in South Africa at the time. Africans came only in 1933. It's a new language. African languages, no one cared about those. So these were the only two official languages. But there's a man, a black man, an African man, sat and listened to the sermons. In that camp meeting, he accepted Jesus. Not only did he accept Christ, he accepted Adventism. That was a game changer. This man had been a teacher. This man was a court interpreter. This man was an intelligent man. This man did a whole lot of things in the, particularly the Eastern Cape, what we call today as the Eastern Cape. For he had been born in a village just outside of Grahamstown This man was soon noticed by another man, Pastor G.W. Schoen, who also could speak Dutch, but who was English-speaking. And in all Adventist historical books, this man is never mentioned. Only Schoen is mentioned. And yet this man, Richard Moko, took Pastor Schoen took him around the Northern Cape area, the Eastern Cape area, to places where they founded churches. Schoen would preach, this man would interpret, this man would preach. When he preaches, that is not published. He is known as the one who carried the briefcase when Pastor Sean went around. But without this man Sean would not even be known today. He takes all the credit. Pastor Richard Moko accepted the message In that camp meeting where Pastor Reed was preaching, took a couple of years. Later, they accepted him as a pastor, an itinerant preacher in 1887. Took a couple of years still. Should we or should we not ordain this man? 
has never happened before. He's the first. Well, 1895, this man um, accepted, and in 1995, he was ordained. Some of you will know Bethel College, which closed down in 1991. The one detail you do not know is that Pastor Hyatt, Pastor Schoen, and Pastor Richard Moko went about looking for a campus in a little nondescript place at Goa in Butterworth where they would settle students that were coming in 1937 from Spionkop Spionkop College started when the Union College closed down and they took all the white kids there to study white missionaries taught them on the farm in Guazu Natal but after a while they closed the school 1927 closed Spionkop white school Adventist school took them back to the foot of the Helderbeck mountain where they built Bethel uh, held up a college as we know it and the school remained empty until a decision was taken to take black kids there now when black children went as students there in 1928 the very following year they changed the name when it was a white school it was Spionkop College. But when the black people moved in there a year later, it was then called Spionkop Missionary College. Not only they changed the name, they also changed the curriculum. When the white students were there, they had science, they had biology, they had mathematics and chemistry. But when the black students moved in, in 1928, now they brought in crafts, domestic science, woodwork, uh, uh, and other subjects because they said we are preparing them. You see, it's a missionary college. White kids don't need to be ministered to. In fact, we call Solusi, which was established in 1894, the first mission school outside of North America. Helderbeck or, or Union College should have been the first mission school in 1893 because it came before uh, Solusi. But the white brethren said, no, uh, we create missionaries. You cannot send missionaries to us. We are not lost. We can only use the word missionary, mission as it relates to natives and black people, not to whites. So, going back to this man, he is an unsung pioneer. When we talk about the list of all the brethren that came particularly from the, from the U.S. to come and serve, there are a whole lot of people um, I did mention in the beginning that uh, your master guide program would mention all of them. He is not mentioned there. But I need to say the black church is because Richard Moko was. If we do not have this man, the forerunner, the man that would sit right at the back during a meeting of white ministers, what we call workers' meetings, when there were no black pastors, and he would sit over there, but who would stand and make critical contributions in those meetings and would never get any credit. Were it not for him and his stubborn resilience, to keep on keeping on 
as a pathfinder, if Landela, of all of us, black pastors in contemporary times, it is up to us to credit this man, to acknowledge him and what he was able to do because no one else will do it. And so we have a few brethren in the Eastern Cape, the Northern Cape, 1895, the forerunner, Richard Moko. Then we have D. Moloko Me. Those who are from Orlando East, I don't know if there's anyone from Orlando East SDA here, will know that uh, Pastor Moloko Me is the father of our, the late Mrs. Mpakele there. He is the first pastor, black pastor, in what used to be called the Rand, what we now call, would call Gauteng. Uh, He's the first pastor back in 1918. Um, and then we have Pastor David Galaga in Lesotho, the publisher. Here is a, uh, another man you may want to spend time just uh, um, reading about what this pioneer did for the work there. We have a number of institutions, Kolo Mission and others, 1899, started uh, uh, by this man. And then, of course, we have a man who would go preaching on horseback, Pastor John Metcalf Truby. Of, of Swaziland. This man accepted evangelism in a place called New Emelo in Emelo in Pumalanga. That's where he met Adventism there. Went back to his home country, Swaziland, as a pioneer. He's also not mentioned. Instead, Potier, the white missionary, is the one that is mentioned. But um, the interesting thing with white missionaries is that they would show up here and say, I have discovered the Victoria Falls. I have discovered this place. How do you come all the way here to discover what we always had? Pastor Shubi, what a man. Pastor Shubi was the secretary in Mpumalanga, what you call Mpumalanga today, of the African National Congress. You did not doubt. He was a trade unionist before he accepted Pastor Shubi. And this is the man that established churches on horseback in Swaziland. In KwaZulu Natal, we have a man there, the first black pastor in KwaZulu Natal, more specifically in Zululand, the Zuland area. His name was Pastor James Moya. He was called Pastor James Moyo when he arrived from Zimbabwe, from southern Rhodesia. But when he arrived, Atamazulu, we don't have Moyo here. Where does he come from? He had to change his surname to Moya. Those of you who are from the Trans Origin Conference will know Pastor Evans Moya. This is his father. The father of Pastor James Moya is. Uh, uh, of Pastor Evans Moya was James Moya. This is the first uh, pastor, black pastor in, uh, in Zululand in Nongoma. But something happened there very quickly before we, we round off. When James Moya started working, he worked with a man called Frank Armitage, an American missionary. But there was someone else there who also does not receive credit. This was 
um, Alfred Lutuli. Alfred Lutuli, who was the uh, brother to Chief Albert Lutuli. Alfred had come when their father died. He died. His grave is in Solusi Mission, in Solusi University. His grave is over there. And Alf, Chief Albert Lutuli, of course, later called Chief. But when he was 13, he was an Adventist until he was 13 years old. When Chief Albert Lutuli was 13, him, his mother, and his brother Alfred came back from Rhodesia. They came to settle Guadugosa at Groutville. And they stayed there. And when he was, he was still Adventist until the UCC church decided he will not be Adventist anymore. His mom remained Adventist. His brother left and went to Friday and went to Wanongoma uh, and met up with Pastor James Moya and Frank Armitage and they settled 1909 in that area and started what was called the Zulu Mission. There were no fields, there were no conferences. The Zulu Mission. Black people were not allowed at the time. Black pastors were not allowed to be presidents of anything. All these, even though they were in black areas, were administered by white missionaries. And the black pastors were there, you know, um, on their bicycles and things like that. But the prophecy stayed. Africa will rise. Africa will rise. What we have seen Blacks began to ask questions, began to agitate. Why don't we have schools? Why don't we have hospitals? Why are all these things retirement villages, old age homes? Why are they only confined to white Adventists? Why not us? And through the agitation of what used to be called preacher, uh, preacher's councils, particularly in the rent area, we began to see 1933 Nogupila Hospital, Sophia Town, came up. It was not because of the goodwill of the white Adventists. It was because of the agitation of brethren who said, we want our institutions as well. And so Nogupila stood not very far from where we are right here. One of the patients, notable patients of Nogpila Hospital, was a young lady, Miriam Makeba, who came into our hospital, Nogpila, young. It's only a line, a sentence that would write her name, having gone through the corridors of the Adventist Hospital, Nogpila. 1959. The school had the hospital had to close down. Again, there was agitation. Why do you close it down? Why do you close black institutions? It had to be closed down, and some of the furniture was shipped over to um, Maluti, which had started in 1951, and some uh, workers. But there's another reason why Nukpila closed down. Father Trevor Hattelson, the Anglican, had received letters from black workers at Nogupila Hospital that they are not being treated well by white Adventist administrators. An Anglican had to intervene in an Adventist institution where white Adventist administrators were not treating black workers well. The intervention didn't come from the conference office or the union. 
it came from Anglicans. And the pastors, white pastors, Pastor J.D. Hakom and others, Stevenson, felt we can't have Anglicans run our institutions. These African laborers here don't know what is good for them. This institution will go down, and it did go down in 1959. And so we had to close. Well, folks, who is going to tell our stories? Who is going to tell our children where we come from? We had to close a number of schools right here in Johannesburg. Black schools, Alexander, had to close down. Had to close. That little school on 5th Avenue, 6th Avenue, Alexander, plus the school in Orlando West. Nelson Mandela went to, was to say later, my kids went to Orlando West before they went off to Swaziland. They started off at Evlagazi Street or whichever, Kumalo, whichever street you are referring to. They studied there at our school. And so what did we do? 1998, when Fitzhenry got here, I was one of those, I think Pastor Maligudu, I don't know whether he has arrived here, and others. We all received calls at night if we could assist in inviting Nelson Mandela to come and grace the occasion of the opening of Pentecost 98 at Vista, Clint, at Vista uh, in Soweto. And Nelson Mandela ever so kindly acknowledged the invitation but responded that I'm sorry I will not attend the Adventist service. Because this is the church when I was incarcerated, when I was in prison, in detention, I don't remember even once the Adventist church rising up, standing, and say, free Nelson Mandela. Instead, what we have heard about the Adventist church is that this church has aligned itself with the oppressors. I'm sorry I will not attend. That is why we, will not, we did not have him attend the opening of Pentecost 98. Our history in this country is not a proud history. No one is going to do anything for us. We'll have to do stuff. We'll have to do things for ourselves. The final nail was in 1991 when Bethel College had to close. When it had to close. These are students who were moved forcibly from place to place. First, they moved into Spionkop when it was vacated by others who did not think Spionkop was good enough. But it was good enough for black people. So they were put in there. 1937, it had to close again. The last graduating class was addressed. There were only 12 students, which was addressed by Pastor Ega J. Kuboni. In 1937, when Spion Corp Missionary College closed down, what happened to the students? They were sent back to start a new school in Butterworth called Bethel College. We had hoped Bethel will sustain our legacy, but it had to be sacrificed in 1991. There were two colleges when the unions came together, Helderbeck and Bethel. The question was, which one should stand and which one should go? In those air-conditioned boardrooms in Bloemfontein, the response was simple. Which one must go? 
Bethel College must go. With all the buildings, with all the infrastructure, it had to close down. And a school held up a college survived. So, here is a recommendation to Adventists who love a little bit of our history. As a church to remain relevant to the mission. There are a number of things we need to do. First, we need to acknowledge that we are Ethiopians, we are Kushites, we are Nubians, we are Africans, we are a black church. Our worship must reflect that. We are tired of seeing Western style worship in African churches. We need to acknowledge the soil because we cannot stoop and touch the soil squeeze it with our hands and fingers touch the moving soil and the moving soil is another human being we need to reach out interface, connect know who we are if, 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 if we begin to do that if we need to bring the songs of Africa and sing African songs like Africans and not have anyone look at us as kinds and say, who are you? We are Africans. And that must reflect in our sermons. Those who have occasion to stand behind the wooden pulpits. Oh, I guess they are not wooden anymore. I saw a glass one right here. It's a postmodern pulpit, this one. Those who have occasion to stand behind pulpits, no, no, for contemporary preachers speak the word like an African preacher. Speak without fear or favor like Richard Mocker, surrounded by a sea of white, but stood head and shoulders above everyone and spoke for he knew there will be others like him long after 1932, after he would have died. There will be others he must lead by example and speak without institutional splendor, without resources. Speak. If you read the policy books of the church in the 30s, in the 20s, the 30s, on the one side, you had car allowance for white pastors. Then you had bicycle allowance for black pastors. We need preachers today who will remember that and speak not a bourgeoisie gospel but a gospel of the village a gospel of the townships the songs we sing must change that is why when my younger brother plays on these things and says, Asaki Limpelala. We are pilgrims. We are going somewhere. Those are the songs we want to hear. Out of nothing, God has created a people. Let's acknowledge that. We are who we are because of these men, because of Richard Moko. Pastor Mseleko one of the two pastors who slept on a tree 
I'll talk about Mseleku. When Hakom left him in Haman's kraal, I don't know who's from Pretoria here. And when they left him there, they said, we'll see you after three months. Don't come back until you start a church here. And the white pastor dropped him off and left him there. He had nowhere to go. No church, no Adventist presence in that entire area. Went to the first house in Haman's kraal. Knocked there. They opened the door. Can we help you? Says, I'm a pastor. He had his briefcase with everything in it. So what do you want? Well, I want a place to rest my head, to sleep overnight. Just one night. And doors were slammed. His face. Pastor Mselegu. It was dark. So he looked around, saw a tree, and he went up that tree, pulled out his belt, and he threw that around a branch, steadied himself. That's where he positioned himself throughout the night. I haven't tried it because I drive my car. I have a cell phone. I have a laptop. I have an iPad. He didn't have all that. He stayed there for the three months. Today, we probably have more than five, six, almost ten churches in that area. There are pastors. Some of them have become presidents of the trans Conference who come from the Hamas Kral area. Do they even know how it all started. May God be with us. Let us preach like Mseleku. Let us preach like Pastor Moabi, who even though he couldn't see properly anymore, was there. Pastor S.J. Kanyile, who even though he was totally blind, continued to serve he's never acknowledged let us serve like Pastor Ega J. Kuboni the first man who wrote the book The Universal Church of God that's how it was translated but it took him 11 years for the Sentinel Publishing under White Adventist Administration to publish that book they could not accept a black man can write a book. VOP in Cape Town who was asked to take the manuscript and see if they could publish. They sent this to this pastor and said, and said what's your opinion? Can this African pastor write something like this? He died in 1961 from Sikuboni. In 1960, almost 1961, his book was published. He never saw a cent. It's only when the Lord returns that he'll even be told that your book was published. Let us change gears. The African church must rise. Stretch out your hands to God in adoration, it says. All our churches, village-based, township-based, suburbs, wherever our churches are, we need to hear Africa singing. We need to hear African preachers preaching the word. Not like Westerners. Do it differently. We can't have a young man coming out, raised by Abogogo, by grannies, going to Helderbeck. After four years, they come out and they go back to their village church to speak English. We can't have that. Let us embrace the 
gospel within particularity of our culture, particularity of our languages. There are sin in our languages. If you have to sway from side to side as you sing, do it. Do it. Because it's who we are. God bless you. May God keep us greener. And the sun. And the friends. See, the friends are not defined. It's all of us. Bless you. Bless you. He's an African. He's an African minister. Keep ministering. Do it. Turn things around. Bring a new revolution everywhere. Richard Moko is passing the baton. Take the baton and keep serving God fearlessly. Don't be conventional. Don't walk like a, a deacon. Stand. Because this is God who raised you at a time such as this. As an African missionary, Sister Gail says we are music missionaries, we are musicians, singers of the gospel. And so may this service here and now be anointed by the Lord. And may this ministry keep going, keep going. A couple of years ago he came to Guazu Natal and he was doing ministry on stage. It was only during lunch when someone pulled me aside and said there was trouble outside for they could not understand that they have this minister Ongo, yeah, at the university during that music festival. And I said, what's the problem? He's fresh. He's different. Perhaps that's what God needs. Different. Let's do it. Serve God differently. Let's go back. The vessels family, they sold the farm. Sister White said, don't sell it. That farm is going to serve the church sold it with diamonds Ellen White wrote songs when he the family was bankrupt and they were auctioning off their furniture on top of the wardrobe were letters and opened letters all of them when they were moving furniture trucks outside auctioning letters of Ellen White fell off and Peter sat down opening each one of them and wept like a child admonishings and counsels don't sell take care of African work he cried it was too late may God bless you keep going before you know it, we will all hear the words, well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. And so let's be there, each one of us. This revolution might be slightly outside of what we know divine service to be.
for him for this ministry that it must keep going our history our stories are incomplete we're not in the final chapter of this book yet help us to finish this this African Adventist narrative gracious father in heaven we want to thank you for moments like this. Thank you for the sacred space. The path that we are trotting, that we are walking on right now. Thank you, Father, for being patient with us. Thank you for allowing us to correct the mistakes of the past of those who failed the mandate to serve people. Help us to serve people. Help us, Father, to stay relevant and germane to the cause. Elders may not understand this. Pastors may not understand this. But it is time, Father, to be understood by you. I pray for this ministry that Estrina would do what you have asked him to do, what you have planted in him to do. I pray, Father, that he will go to the valleys He'll go to the mountains. He'll go to the byways and the highways and go on the dead roads of our communities, our churches. I pray, Father, that he will turn things around there with the word, with the music. I pray, Father, that he will bring healing. I pray that you bring transformation. I pray that you anoint him, Father, for this time, for 2023 and beyond. I pray for resources. I pray for those blessings that only you can give to enable him, to equip him, to empower him to do this work. If he has to fly to all kinds of places, Father, to plant hope in those places, I pray that you give him those resources. I pray that you open the hearts of those who are looking at this ministry, who will say, we will support this ministry. With the blessings you have given to us, I pray, Father, that wallets will open up so that your children will bless the work that he does. It's not for him, Father. It's for this sin-sick world. And so I pray that you bless him, this modern missionary. Bless him the band, the team, the family as they do this work, Father. One day there will be a great harvest when we see Richard Moko, David Galaka, Molokome, Klubi, when we see all these men and their families, James Moyer, and get reintroduced to everybody. Pastor Kuboni. All of these pioneers. I pray that Dina will emerge also. And say, I'm here by God's grace as well. Take this service now, Father, throughout this day and beyond. Bless it. 
and every one that will ascend this platform to sing and to minister today and this evening I pray for a special anointing upon each person we should not be saying we were at a concert we should say all of us had a privilege to be at this special service special ministry and when we go back home we should say thank you Jesus for saving us so and so I leave him in your hands now have thine own way with him whatever it is so that one day he will say face to face with Christ my redeemer thank you Jesus for hearing us in Jesus name we've prayed Amen gathered here to appreciate life. Um. appreciate this family. We thank God for your forefathers. <laughs> yeah. We will not be here had it not been of this. We would not be here. The spirit of appreciation. Uh, we started a foundation called Kenan Friends with my brother there, Bonga, and Fiso come, and Fiso go say, this is what we just want to do. We just want to serve God. And uh, it's difficult sometimes because you have to keep going. You got to. You can't drop the ball. So we have a token of appreciation our Please, Mufundis, come pray for us. Uh, uh, pray for the family and pray for this foundation. Um, there's people who took care of this and we appreciate you wherever you are. We pray the Lord be with you. By the way, when we did this, Baba V and Mama G said, no, we are coming. They are very expensive. They just came. In the true sense, they are expensive. They are paid big money. They said, no, we are coming. <sighs> Please pray, bro. And thank you so much for your big shoulders. Thank you. Thank you. Maboni, thank you. Thank you.
Richard Moko. Bekwa, Pansi. Kora ba utwala umsebenzi wako. Ba wenza iskati singa vumi. Kora ba wenza umsebenzi. Ba utwala ngamashombe abtaga taga. Kora ba wenza umsebenzi. Nasi isi zuguluwa sina songo 2023. Sia togoza baba gopkulu bako. Ubatini ile abantu bako. Asbaboni abanyi o vesel na abanyi la. Sbona isi zuguluwa ni sali andota. Ivulanjela. Is Twalandwe, that stalwart who carried the gospel in villages, in areas where there was no presence. Today, we want to say thank you, Jesus. It won't be long now when the trumpet will sound. Is our Puma Lianz Iswa? Is our Puma Baba Gulandawo? Pam Sisan Kai Bong Kakuruaz, my born is Zulanilis. Say at Elag, Baba Tatin Dawo, Gulaba, is Babonala. Magzwagal Yonkin Daw would basse corn. They are still there. Tatinda woke baba wakri ninjalo. Bye bambe lendo. Bye bambe, bye bambe, banga ilashi. Bye bambe, ngalolosuku. That great reunion. Babe koda. Nabanyi, Jehovah. Babe koda, all our pioneers around Pastor Moko. Babe Kona on the sea of glass. Bless this generation of the Mokos. Keep them going, Father. Keep them going and keep the ministry going until Jesus says, Well done. In Jesus' name, Amen. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> to the seas we unavoca. Maranatha Masala. Wonge umdo koyo apange kamaga Yesu Christu. Amen. Kumkuluwa utadewetu mnini. She is fifth generation. People who know Stasa will probably know her mother. Undo mbengulu, ne? Undo mbengulu moko. So she is daughter of Undo mbengulu. Azani ya mekuto, utinilosha na mekuto. I just want to say a little something. Message of gratitude to organizers, but also it's not a challenge. Thank you Mfundi Suntla for that powerful uh, talk. 
2013, brief background on what we are working on. We are still working on it. 2013, we were driving home with my elder brother here. He's in the media space. I'm also in the media space. He's like, hi, man. We need to do something about Richard Mork. During that drive, we had also oh. known that there's a gentleman called Uhlanga Mafani, who is also in the Eastern Cape, who has written a book on Richard Mork. And we managed to get his contacts. So we drove down, managed to get a, a sit-down interview with uh, Mr. Mafani. We managed to get a sit-down interview. It was 2013, December, 2014, January. Also managed to get an interview with Utata Utuma, who Mr. Jack knows very well. They from the same place, Ekinsberg. Now Utata Utuma and I had written a song about Richard Mock. So we sat down with him. We also sat down with an uncle of ours, grandfather Wake, Utatu Felix Mock, who passed away, I think 2017, 2015. Lost my track of time. So Utata Umoko passed away 2015. Utatu Duma passed away around about that time. So they passed away the same year. I think Utatu Duma actually passed away a few months after that interview. So I think God had led my brother to help us work on this thing. And I had done a research on Richard Moko early on, this is school in, I think around 2008. I just want to touch on what Mfunis was saying. As Adventists, maybe I should say as black Adventists, we have a weakness of, of, of not appreciating our own. Yeah. The history yeah. that I had found about Richard Moko, it was from a white guy called Keith oh. Tankard who was a historian in East London, who also passed away. He has a very touching story that he wrote about Richard Moko when he was preaching and uh, doing missionary work in a place called East Bank location in East London. I think it's that area now called Duncan Village or that area, or oh, just on the other side of the Buffalo River. Moko went into territory where there were other Christian pioneers from other churches. And they were not happy with his message of the Sabbath because it was something new to them, so they didn't understand it. So, you know, people tend to get territorial. I don't know why Christians do this, but I think not. So they were not happy with Mogo's message. And there was an uproar, there was a conflict. Richard Mogo was hit, he lost a tooth or some teeth. They say, I think Uputlanga actually documented this. Keith Tank had also told a story about this. He said, Morgo's response was, if I have to, I will carry on preaching this message until I lose all of my teeth. Mm. That's how convinced he was about the message that he was preaching. So here's a challenge to you, Dina. We are working on this documentary. We've interviewed these people. Babuntlap, we need you to be part of the document. We need a soundtrack for the document. <laughs> we thank you all for being here. We thank you for the honor. Let us appreciate our own. You understand what I'm saying when I say that. Thank you very much. Um, we were about to, maybe let's have, no, let's get into the word. Elder, we have sponsors who took care of us, uh, Blackie Funerals, they took care. Do you have the clip ready? Thank you so much. We've got Mills on Wheels, Abazali Bay too. When you live here, we are going to give you a food parcels. Thank you so much for coming. Um, maybe whilst at it, on the 29th of June next year, we are meeting again. So, in course, we are going to celebrate and celebrate. Amen.
Amen. But on the 29th of June, we are meeting. I just saw my cousin Hazins. How are you? <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much. Fiso, are we good? All right. Let's let's just get into the, 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 the word. Let's prepare for this word. Okay. Junior, are you ready? and <laughs>
There's a quartet in the house. Come, guys. Um, did you hear them earlier? Harmonium. Are they here? Are they still here? No, they are gone. Are they gone? Please, come, gents. I was to F. The next voice is our pastor, all the way from Swaziland. Truly, they're going to do two songs. Amen. 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 Front of house sound, can you help us? We just struggled with the other time. We're just going to check the mics. One, one. This is first, then a second. Barts and bass, can you just help us quickly? Testing, 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 thank you. One, two, are we good? Testing, okay, here we go. One, two, one, two, can I have more? Om Sindhi Si Om Sindhi Si Uwe Om Li Temba Lam Yes, what? Go ahead. Go ahead. Gong 
This is a request from Mvundis. Amen. Number 53. Bible reads, for if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will arise will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. <laughs> May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Let us pray. Babelolungile nalo wethembekile wena uNkulunkulu wethembeka tikhatsi tonke nasi sikhatsi uNkulunkulu la usibutsene inkosi ngale nandlela siyathandaza ke uNkulunkulu ukuthi ukhulumisane nathi khuluma uNkulunkulu netinhliti yotethu khuluma uNkulunkulu netimo tethu khuluma somandla ngendlela lesimanga wendele buhle nekudunyiswa kweligama lakho Mtandazo wa misimagatze kusikonge na sekwendegi. Buso betu buge suluini. Mm. Akrestus ya tandaza. Amen. In the next few minutes, I just want us to look at the book of Esther. The book of Esther is a very interesting book. 
in this book, the name of God is not mentioned. But we do see the hand of God move in a mighty way. Even though his name is not mentioned, we still see God delivering his people. Even though his name is not mentioned, we still see God provide for his people. Maybe let me be quick to speak to myself. Because there has been days where I never prayed. But I still got, saw God provide for me. There has been days where I never bothered to call on his name. But I still saw the hand of God. In the book of Esther, his name is not mentioned. But he still moves. In Esther chapter 1, the Bible tells us that the king throws a banquet. He is excited. He's invited his friends. The queen also throws a banquet. The king gets drunk. And then he calls for the queen. When the queen is called, the Bible says the queen refused to come. And the king was informed that the queen had to refuse. The Bible says the king was very angry. And the men say to the king, O oh king, if you do not deal with the queen, we are in trouble in our homes. Our wives will disrespect us if you do not deal with the queen. The Bible says the queen was then remo removed. And the Bible says when you go to chapter 2, the Bible says the men come to the king again and they say to the king, Oh king, you must find another queen. Let's go out through the land and find you the next queen. And the Bible introduces another family. It is a Jewish family. Mordecai is staying with his cousin by the name of Esther. Esther has lost both her parents. And the Bible says Mordecai suggests that Esther joins and goes to the palace to try her luck. Esther agrees and she goes to the palace. When they get to the palace, the girls were given an opportunity to present themselves before the king. The girls would look for the best robe. The girls would look for the best jewelry so that they would look good for the king. And the Bible says when it was Esther's turn to go and present herself before the king. The Bible says Esther went to a man by the name of a guy. Her guy had worked, served the king for so many years. And Esther asked her guy, what does the king like? What, what, what's the king's favorite color? And the Bible says Esther put on only what her guy had suggested. Because Esther understood that it was not about her, but it was about pleasing the king. And the Bible says Esther was chosen as the next queen. In chapter 3, the Bible says the king promotes another man by the name of Haman. Haman is promoted. He's a very evil man. Haman wants people to worship him. He wants people to bow when he passes by. So in Mordecai, he works at the palace gates. Haman goes in to see the king. The guards at the palace gates, they throw themselves on the ground. Mordecai does not bow. The guards say to Mordecai, what is wrong with you? Did you not see that was Haman passing? Mordecai says, I am aware that was Haman passing, but I am a Jew, I bow to no man. The Bible says, then they report Mordecai to Haman. When Mordecai is reported to Haman, Haman checks Mordecai's file. He discovers that Haman is a Jew. He, he, he discovers that Mordecai is a Jew. He says, I'm not only dealing with him, but I'm dealing with all the Jews to teach him a lesson. They pass a decree that after a year, all the Jews are going to be killed. He goes to the king. The king signs the decree. The decree is passed. Mordecai gets to hear of the decree. He goes into mourning. The children, the, the, the Jews are troubled. They are worried that they are going to be killed. And the Bible says, and then Mordecai goes into mourning, removes his clothes, put on a sackcloth, throws himself on the ground. Word reaches Esther that your cousin has lost it. And the Bible says Esther sends clothes to, for Mordecai to wear. Mordecai refuses to wear the clothes. He says, tell Esther to do something for us. When Esther hears the request from Mordecai, he says, there's nothing I can do. Me and the king are not vibing at the moment. The man has not called me for about 30 days. If I go to see the king uninvited, I might be killed. That's what Esther says. And they tell this to Mordecai. When Mordecai receives that, he says in verse 14, he says, Esther, if you choose to be silent, at a time like this, deliverance will arise from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. But who knows? Maybe you are placed in the palace for such a time as this. If you had said a powerful amen, I was closing this thing. But you did not let me run with it one more time. Listen to Mordecai. He says, Esther, if you choose to be silent at a time like this, at a time of great moral conflict, 
Esther, you cannot be silent. Because you see, brothers and sisters, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in times of comfort. It is when a man stands in times of challenge and, conflict, and controversy. And the Bible says, brothers and sisters, Mordecai says to Esther, Esther, if you are silent at a time like this, deliverance will arise from another place. Esther, you cannot be silent. Because sometimes when we are silent, we are choosing betrayal. See, you see, you see, brothers and sisters, there is a, there, the hottest place in hell is reserved for those who choose to be, to be neutral in times of moral conflict. It is Desmond Tutu who says, if, a, if an elephant places its foot on the, on the tail of a mouse and you choose to be neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. Esther, you cannot be silent. And then Mordecai says, so that I close this thing. He says, Esther, deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. Now, Mordecai is a Jew. He, he believes that if Esther does not step up, God would save his people in some way. You did not get it. Mordecai is a Jew. He knows that if Esther does not step up and do something, deliverance will arise from another place because Mordecai had been told that the God of Israel had delivered his people in the past in unusual ways. When the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt, God stepped in and delivered his children. When the children of Israel were stuck by the Red Sea, they thought it was all over. God stepped in, delivered his people. The Bible says the children of Israel are stuck by the Red Sea. They do not know what to do. They say to Moses, oh Moses, what is this that you have done? It was better for us to die in Egypt. Why would you bring us out here to perish in the wilderness? And Moses says, oh Israel, hold your peace. Look carefully at these Egyptians. For these Egyptians, you see today, you will see them no more. God was able to deliver his people. And Mordecai knew that if God God was able to deliver them in the past he'd be able to deliver them again that's why he says to Esther Esther if you keep silent God will deliver his people Oh, my brothers and sisters, God was able to deliver the children of Israel in the wilderness. When they were hungry, did he not give them manna? When they were thirsty, did he not bring water off of a rock? God was able to deliver them in the past. And if he was able to do it in the past, surely he would be able to do it again. So he says, deliverance will arise from another place. So my brother, my sister, I want to say to you, if Esther chooses to be silent, and not help you, deliverance will arise from another place. If Esther fails you, my brother, my sister, don't give up. Deliverance will arise from another place. If, the, if, if they refuse to give you that loan, my brother, my sister, don't worry. Deliverance will arise from another place. If the doctors tell you that there's nothing they can do for you, my brother, don't worry. Deliverance will arise from another place. If Esther chooses to be silent, deliverance, God will find a way. If he was able to make a way for the children of Israel in the Red Sea, he will be able to make a way for you. Because the one we serve is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And then he says to Esther, Esther, who knows? Maybe you were placed in the palace for such a time as this. He says, Esther, you, who knows? Maybe you were placed past tense for such a time as this present tense. Let me come with that again so that you get it. He says, Esther, you were placed past tense for such a time as this present tense. The other day I came across an English word and, they, and this word says proleptic. What this word means, it simply means the answer comes before the question. So that when the question is asked, you do not struggle to find the answer. Because it arrives before the question. 
you, you, you did not get it. Maybe Joseph will help us understand this thing. Do you remember Joseph when he was thrown in, in the pit by his brothers? Do you remember when they sold him to Ishmaelite traders? Do you remember how he became a slave in Potiphar's wives? Do you remember how Potiphar's wife lied about him and he was thrown into prison? And the Bible says, and then Joseph at the end of it all, he became ruler in Egypt in a foreign land. And the Bible says there was famine in Israel. And Jacob says to his son, there is food in Egypt. He sends them to get the food in Egypt. Remember, brothers and sisters, the Bible says when they get to Egypt, Joseph is able to recognize his brothers, but they were not able to recognize him. And the Bible says, Joseph says to his brothers, you meant to harm me, but God meant it for the good. When Joseph was in the pit, God was at work fixing the famine problem. For God moves ahead of his children. When Joseph was in prison, God was at work fixing the famine problem because God moves ahead of his children. That is why David then shouts and says, the Lord is my shepherd. He moves ahead of the sheep. The sheep follow from behind. It's not the sheep that leads the shepherd, but it's the shepherd that leads the sheep. He says he moves, brothers and sisters. Ahead of his children. So we may not know what the future holds. But we know who the future, who holds the future. He's the one who moves ahead of his children. And he says, who knows? Maybe you were placed in the palace. When God placed you inside. He was fixing this problem we are faced you were faced with it today. In other words, Mordecai is saying to Esther, Esther, maybe God fixed this thing long time ago. When he placed you inside. Let me close it now, brothers and sisters. Listen to what the word of God says. Esther is a Jew. But Mordecai and Esther decided to keep it a secret. The king does not know. That he is married to a Jew. Haman is not aware. When he comes up with this evil plot. Haman is not aware. That the queen is a Jew. When the decree is passed. Some Jews are worried. Because they do not know. That the queen is a Jew. Oh you are not getting this thing my brothers and sisters. The Jews did not understand. That they had one of their own. On the inside, when the decree was passed, the Jews had somebody on the inside. The, sometime last year, I was invited for camp meeting in Kenya. I'm invited for camp meeting. Few days before I travel, I discover that my passport had expired. So, I, and in the process of getting a new one, takes a long time. I realized that I'm not going to make it for this trip. Before, before, before I cancel the trip, I call my sister. And my sister reminds me that one of our members works at the home affairs offices. I call, I call this member. I say, I have a situation here. My passport has expired. And she says to me, Pastor, make your way to the home affairs offices. I made my way to the home affairs offices. When I got to their brothers and sisters, there was a long queue. But guess what? I did not stand in the queue. Because I had somebody on the inside. I went into her office. I went into her office. I, I put my documents on her desk. Some documents were missing. And she says to me, Pastor, don't worry. I will push it for you from the inside. I went home, brothers and sisters. Later, I received a phone call. She says to me, Pastor, your passport is ready. You can come and collect it. The process that takes, that takes weeks for me it took only a few hours. You know why? Because I had somebody on the inside. The Jews had somebody on the inside. Before I sit down, my brothers and sisters, I want to let you know that there is hope for somebody. There is hope for the worst sinners. There is hope for prostitutes. There is hope for humanizers. There is hope for drug dealers. There is hope for humanity. Because we have somebody on the inside. John says, my naked children, I am writing to you these things that you may not sin. But if you do sin, don't worry. You have an advocate with the Father. We have a man on the inside. We have someone pleading for us from the inside. Oh, we are standing today 
not because we are strong not because we are better than anyone but it is because we have someone on the inside we have a man inside oh my brothers and sisters now we can come before the throne of grace boldly you know why because we have someone on the inside ah revelation chapter 5 john writes and he says i looked and i saw a book no one was stepping up to open it he says i was worried and the elder comes john weep not for the lion of the tribe of judah is worthy to open the scroll and break the seals of john says i turned to look behold the lamp was standing there on the inside we have a man on the inside so when the devil who is the accuser of the brethren when he accuses us in the heavenly court with all the evidence before our, the judge who is God presents all the evidence our advocate Jesus Christ stands up stretches his hand and he says father I object and the father will then say objection sustained because we have a man on the inside so how man you can bring it how man you can come with all your bodies we are not afraid we have a man on the inside may the lord bless the reading of his word amen Let us pray. Babel Shala is ruin. Ye so on Gossia to Jesu Christo. As God took two lanatin for the beds. Sipper spins the sex so goom. Sipper man like Gugmele and it cut it up, my team. Sipper spins in a second seven day. Siabong and Anamusha was Kumbuda. Good to know my bang as Tassel and Alan and Angalan. Cinnamon for Cinnelling a cart. Long meli wetu Masbambelele nkulu nkulu kuse kbese kutineni Na kresu ya tandaza, amen Wow We have a man inside Abana chance We have a man inside Oh my God, let's just do one verse as conquerors come. Tell about the battle, or must a punya Nisale Nina Ninga Hambi. Says our Puma Tinu Kukaba, Nina Makest, Kalan Sal. Amen. Amen. <laughs> conquerors is going to close for us. When I save the wondrous. On which the Prince of Glory died. Did such love and sorrow meet? Hallelujah. They'll be here tonight. You know, tonight we are having fun in the Lord. Amen. Clean fun. So, Baba V is in the house. <laughs> so, one, this is Conquerors. I think you want to check your mics. One, two, one, two. one, two. Testing one, two. Amen. In Kosovo, we see the name After this, Abba Nisale Bantabatala, Tina Sazao. Angit.
I, 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 this microphone to have base. Uh, so, <laughs> all right. Uh, so, clearly, men power gichi ge ukukaba season meta ama food parcels. Yes. Uh, so, yes. Tell us this again. Tinabani. Thank you so much. We are we are we are done. Mil, uh, yeah yeah yeah. We are done. This is what Mills on Wheels is blessing our our senior citizens with. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And Namache uge akona enza opuza manje uguti ni puza mapilis bandabata. So God bless you. Till we meet again. Amen. Bye bye, Basalwan. We'll meet at six o'clock. Bye.